Okay. Hello, welcome everyone. My name is Sarah Carr and I'm coordinator for the Coastal Marine Ecosystem Based Management Tools Network, um, which is coordinated by NatureServe. And we're very pleased uh, to have with us today Zach Ferdania and Nicole Love of the Nature Conservancy, who are going to be presenting on Coastal Resilience 2.0. Um, we're super excited they could be here today and we thank them for, for coming. Um, before we get started, I wanted to let people know a little bit how about the webinar is going to be structured and how to ask questions. So we'll have presentation for about 40 minutes and then we'll save the remaining 20 minutes for uh, question and answers. Uh, there's two ways to ask questions. Uh, you can type the question you have into the question panel of your user interface and then I can relay that the written question to Zach and Nicole, or during the question and answer session, you can raise your virtual hand, there's a little hand icon in your user interface, and then uh, I'll unmute you and you can ask the question directly to Zach and Nicole. Now, you can type questions in throughout the, uh, throughout the presentation, and uh, if, if they're just clarifying questions, uh, we'll ask them at that point to uh, Zach and Nicole, but more substantive questions we'll hold to the end. Okay, well, thank you so much, guys, and I'll turn it over to you now, Zach. Excellent. Thank you so much, Sarah and the EBM Tools Network for having uh, me, Zach Ferdania, uh, and Nicole Love. We're both at the Nature Conservancy. I work for our Global Marine Initiative uh, that does uh, work across different marine spatial planning, uh, integrated ocean management, fisheries, and uh, what we call climate and disaster risk reduction strategies, of which Nicole and I will present today and a particular tool that we call Coastal Resilience 2.0. Um, if you know uh, Coastal Resilience 1.0 from the, the past, this program and web mapping that we are doing started in 2008 on Long Island uh, and has now expanded into a global network of different marine uh, uh, and coastal web mapping tools that uh, Nicole and I will present, really focused on disaster risk reduction, assessing risk and vulnerability, and with an eye towards nature-based solutions and how it can be uh, uh, used and promoted through adaptation planning and implementation. There are many, many people that are involved in the Coastal Resilience Network that we call it, many partners and people that you see here. Uh, the, the, the logos in the center of the screen represent sort of our uh, core or platinum level partnerships. Uh, uh, besides TNC, we have the Natural Capital Project, a, a group of folks that, that we've directly worked with in the coastal area on uh, coastal protection, coastal engineering uh, solutions using nature-based solutions. Uh, we've worked with NOAA and its Coastal Services Center since the very beginning, uh, designing the initial web mapping utility uh, that, that you'll see as it has evolved, uh, working on different storm and sea level rise mapping uh, projects. We also work with the Association of State Floodplain Managers on how we connect the floodplain to the coast. Uh, they have helped us uh, in, the, in the initial stages using FEMA's HAZAS tool and how we incorporate economic loss uh, and exposure uh, into coastal resilience. And then we have uh, uh, the University of Southern Mississippi who has been uh, doing a, a principal uh, work in tool development programming. But we also have NASA that helped us uh, initially create the, the sea level rise mapping uh, that we did using uh, IPCC emission uh, reports, the last one back in 2006-2007. Uh, um, and increasingly, we are also working with USGS on some of their, uh, uh, with some of their coastal and marine programs, uh, looking at, again, coastal engineering, but also some of the uh, topographic and LIDAR, uh, topographic bathymetric LIDAR that they're doing and how that integrates into uh, coastal resilience. We are also, TNC is also part of the Digital Coast Partnership, and there's a list of uh, the partners here. Uh, this is a, a great group of, of folks that have looked at uh, different data and tools and training around coastal, uh, the coastal environment. Uh, we've looked and worked with them specifically in some of the coastal inundation toolkit uh, work that is done on the coastal, on, oh, sorry, on the Digital Coast uh, 
uh, website, so I would encourage you to go there and look at some of the resources that uh, specifically address sea level rise, storm surge, coastal hazards, and how we're uh, tackling it through, again, nature-based solutions and, and other solutions that are presented on the site. So what I want to do very briefly is show you the coastal resilience approach, which is really the science policy and decision support, sort of the framework. Uh, and then I'll do a short demo. And then Nicole will pass it to you to do a, 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 a similar demo, but in the Gulf of Mexico. So our approach is really a four-step process that you see here, uh, assessing risk and vulnerability, which is really uh, the risk component is based on exposure, exposure to storms uh, uh, and storm surge and sea level rise, certainly, uh, and the combination of those moving forward. Um, and also vulnerability that looks at the, both the social and economic aspects of uh, coastal communities' vulnerability. Uh, so assessing risk is something that uh, when we started this in 2008, uh, there were not a whole lot of tools that were, that were assessing risk. Now you see um, a lot of great tools, web-based tools that are out there that have a very comprehensive look at assessing risk, uh, which is fantastic. Uh, Coastal Resilience uh, still does that, but with the eye towards how, what is the relationship between assessing risk and identifying solutions. Uh, green infrastructure solutions, natural ecosystems that uh, slow down waves, provide protection, uh, abate coastal erosion, uh, and also how hybrid solutions, kind of the traditional gray infrastructure that is built out, uh, seawalls, groins, and dikes, levees that we see, and how those systems can be coupled with green infrastructure solutions where that makes sense. And so I would say that uh, this identify solutions component of coastal resilience is still really the, the focus of coastal resilience as it applies to then taking action on the ground and in the water. And as you will see, uh, we increasingly work at every scale uh, coastal resilience does in sort of the tool and decision support aspect of this, but also increasingly in the policy and science venues. So taking action then uh, has, has us going to the fourth step of our approach, which is measuring effectiveness. How do we know that the restoration that we're doing is effective in uh, increasing fish population or biomass, and it's also providing the benefits that we hope in uh, slowing down waves, uh, providing coastal protection to communities, and then obviously a feedback loop uh, back to assessing risk. So this is our general approach that we take, again, in science policy and decision support. Uh, Nicole and I will focus uh, today on the decision support tool aspect of this approach. So this is a quick layout of what we will now demo. Um, so the web-based mapping tools and applications, uh, I will present sort of the, the front page of Coastal Resilience 2.0 and then uh, go into two specific uh, geographies, one in New York and one in Puget Sound, Washington, and then pass it over to you, Nicole. That's great. Mm -hmm. OK, so uh, if you go to maps.coastalresilience.org, you will see our network or portal page that is, uh, uh, allows you to browse through all the geographies that we have. Uh, we have a global application and a, and a U.S. national application now, uh, but we also are kind of have a detailed look at eight different U.S. states and two specific uh, uh, locations within uh, within uh, the coastal environment. So uh, one in Ventura, California, another in Puget Sound, Washington. So ten coastal states, U.S. states. Um, uh, but we are also uh, present in four countries in Latin America, Mexico, Belize, Guatemala, and Honduras, as well as three island nations in the Caribbean, Grenada, St. Vincent and the Grenadines, and the U.S. Virgin Islands. And so you can browse through all of these different uh, geographies. And it, um, in each one, you will see that it brings up uh, both the background and if you go to the background, it will go to the website that provides a bunch of detailed information on the site for context. But what you can also do is go to mapping the site itself. 
And so these, this is a sort of a, you can think of it as a web mapping framework that is the same on, in all geographies. And what makes each geography distinct are what we call coastal resilience apps. These apps are on the left-hand side here. And it really, uh, the, the apps are really intended to bring up specific information that illustrate the relationship between ecological, social, and economic resilience. And so it's targeting a specific issue in that relationship at a specific scale. And so uh, the focus of what I want to uh, show you today is really uh, 2.0 as it has evolved in web mapping technology, really focused on design, communication, and uh, performance. And so what I first want to show you is uh, in, in New York and Connecticut, uh, which is this example here. I, I won't go through all of the different aspects that we have of the um, framework or web mapping platform, but I will show you that uh, there's a get started menu and tutorials for you to uh, learn more about how to navigate the site, conduct scenario planning, uh, so we continue to build out different uh, uh, tutorials and videos there. We have partner links. Um, and some of the classic functionality in most web mapping, uh, at the, uh, able, the ability to export a page that you see on the web to a PDF, share and save the, uh, the link that you see, the specific web map that you see, and be able to copy and paste that into uh, an email to send to someone. Um, but what I specifically want to show you is uh, um, this uh, app we call Flood and Sea Level Rise. This will be the first application I show you. And one of the communication aspects that we've really focused on in 2.0 are infographics. Uh, this is an infographic that gives you a quick picture of the current coastal and floodplain inundation scenario, sort of the current sea level rise here with some rain and the river coming down and having a little bit of inundation, and what the future may bring for a specific coastal community or city. Uh, future sea level rise and storm surge, which we've done a lot of uh, mapping and, and combining of those two uh, in New York and Connecticut uh, in partnership with the Goddard Institute, NOAA, and, and USGS, and sort of the methods that I'll be showing. Uh, so the, the infographics are, are incredibly important to us to be able to show the user uh, very quickly uh, what the uh, in, what the app is intended to do and the decisions it's intended to support. And so if I open this up, I, you will see an interface that has you selecting the, the particular geography. And I will go to uh, New York City, and I will zoom in uh, to that. And I'll quickly describe these colors that, uh, that represent the confidence of the mapping. And so um, we've worked uh, very intensely with NOAA and USGS on uh, uh, using that 95% confidence interval on all of our sea level uh, and combined storm surge mapping so that uh, you know it's not a black and white picture. You're either uh, inundated or you're not. But there's a gradient of our, our confidence whether in any particular time stamp whether, uh, whether the geography will be inundated and how much. And so I've moved into the, the New York, uh, southern Manhattan um, uh, area. And you can see that I have slider bars that, that can change the picture on uh, inundation. Um, and it's uh, combined in this example. Uh, now I'm looking at a 2080 emission scenario uh, combined with a Category 2 storm surge. And you can these are grayed out because uh, we're not able to show uh, less intervals uh, and because of the resolution of the data. It's constrained by uh, what we're able to map given the error of the, of the vertical accuracy of the, of the DEM. So I went back to our current uh, storm surge of a Category 2. And if I split the screen, and I'll minimize this, if I minimize this, you can see it's still active. Uh, and now I can do what we, what we classically call uh, split screen scenario planning. I'll go ahead and link these maps. And so on the left, you can see the flood and sea level rise uh, category two uh, storm. And on the right, you can see the same view. Uh, and our coastal resilience apps appearing again on the right-hand side. 
And now I will bring in some of the Hurricane Sandy data from FEMA. This is data that we are not hosting. They're hosting it. Uh, and then we are just using those web mapping services and, and typing them into our system. And so this gives you a quick view of the relationship now of a modeled storm on the left with, a, cat with uh, the, a real storm in the interim sort of first inundation layer that came out of Sandy uh, uh, the days, days after the storm. So this is, again, a, a quick view on how you can then start to do some statistics summary uh, relationship between two different scenarios. If I go back to my left map and I start to open up uh, the different information that we have within the map layers, I can click on uh, es estimated uh, percent building loss, category two storm. This is the FEMA has this uh, data, and it, and it shows me the estimated, estimated percent building loss for that storm uh, and uh, in percentage on the left. And then I can open the same thing on the right to give, again, a handle on uh, how are we doing in our modeling and our accuracy in one sense, uh, and uh, how it compares to a, a storm, an actual storm. And so this is just a, a very quick view of how we've taken sort of, um, you know, we have an infographic that describes what this application is intended to do and support. I've now shown you sort of the design element of scenario planning where you can start to overlay information on a modeled and real storm and compare different uh, social and economic characteristics. I encourage you to look at the other apps within uh, coastal, uh, the, the Coastal Resilience application or web mapping um, that is done in New York and Connecticut. Uh, but I'm going to move on because of time and show you one other um, geography and a, and a completely different app that's related to coastal resilience. And that is on the West Coast. And it is in Puget Sound, Washington. This application uh, that I'll show is called Coastal Defense, and it is a work that we have done, TNC, with uh, in collaboration with USGS and the Natural Capital Project. And it is really sort of a, um, a, a different take on, uh, on how ecosystems can um, can slow down waves or, and provide coastal protection at, at sort of a high resolution um, standpoint here. Again, an infographic uh, that helps you uh, easily interpret what this app is supposed to do. Uh, we have on the top sort of a, if you have tidal marshes and you have a diking system, that that sort of green and gray infrastructure hybrid solution can be uh, helping you in the natural environment, certainly, uh, but also helping the gray infrastructure in its protection as you degrade the habitat you are going to degrade and have to maintain at high, much higher cost the, the gray or diking system infrastructure. So this application, again, is, it works on a bay, bay scale. And so it's a sub-state. And I clicked on the Skagit Bay in, uh, in Puget Sound. And so what this brings up is uh, uh, what are essentially transects that go throughout the Skagit Bay. And if I click on one of them, it will give me an interface that uh, looks at the relationship between um, the uh, waves and wind conditions. And I can set those conditions. I can also set my storm surge uh, and, my, and my water level. Um, that uh, then uh, it gets calculated as those uh, sort of storm conditions as they hit the, the, the marine ecosystem, in this case, uh, tidal marshes. Uh, this red line right here is the dike. Uh, this sort of orange line is the bathymetric profile. And the bar is the existing marsh, inf uh, marsh ecosystem that's, uh, that's in front of the dike. If I unclick this checkbox here, I'm essentially getting rid of the marsh in a future scenario. If I click it back, I can uh, as it say in the future that I want to run a scenario that compares uh, a, a healthy marsh today with a degraded marsh tomorrow, 
or no marsh at all. Um, and in the future, what we want to do is be able to set the dike back and rerun this so that it can give you a, a sort of future scenario of what we hope is an enhanced marsh ecosystem where the dike is set back. We don't have that functionality in right now, so what I will uh, show you is, a, is a, um, a scenario where we have a marsh today and none tomorrow. And again, so what this is going to do it, and I'll minimize this panel in a second so you can see, uh, but this transect is running into, out into the bay. It's calculating those wind and wave characteristics, storm surge and sea level uh, parameters, and is going to give me an output of when the waves hit the marsh, what happens to uh, those waves uh, is in terms of height and uh, energy uh, or wave reduction. And so this output is showing me that, that the blue line here is the current scenario where I have marsh, and that's in this uh, green bar here, that as the wave characteristics hit the marsh, uh, you get a drastic decrease or attenuation of wave height. Uh, and by the time it hits the dike, it's a negligible sort of uh, wave. Uh, as opposed to when, uh, if, if marsh, oops, if marsh is not present in the future, you have this orange line, and there's much less attenuation uh, going through the system without those marshes there. And the output down below uh, talks about uh, the levee is high enough to prevent overtopping in the current scenario. But in the future, and this is sort of a, a gross characteristic of um, it's not completely accurate. All of this stuff obviously needs to be uh, ground truthed um, in working with the diking districts in Skagit Bay. But certainly in a future scenario, it says that it recommends you have to increase the levee uh, so that you have negligible overtopping of the diking system. System. And the same would apply to uh, wave energy, where uh, this orange line in the future, where we have no reduction at all of wave energy because the marsh is not there, uh, will certainly impact that diking system uh, much uh, harder than if you have maintained and even enhanced the marsh. And so as you can see, this is a very uh, site-specific uh, coastal resilience application. Um, I'll minimize this, and you can see that this um, the, the profile goes through the marsh right here. Uh, and then just like in New York and Connecticut, you can bring up uh, other information in Puget Sound in, in the Skagit estuary and start overlaying information on top of it. Uh, so what we've tried to do uh, is, is show you a couple of different applications, one at a state scale, one at a very um, uh, high resolution bay scale to give you a sense of the apps that we have that are again targeting different coastal issues, whether it be coastal inundation and the role that uh, nature can play in, uh, in, in this instance, uh, coastal protection and, and wave attenuation. Um, and there's many, many other things I could show you, but I think uh, in light of the time, I think it would be good if I pass this over to Nicole. And so, Sarah, I don't know if I do that or you do that, but uh, go, I'll ahead. go ahead and do it. Yep. Um, okay. Awesome. And then we'll pass it over to Sarah, uh, sorry, to Nicole to continue. Okay. Let's see. Thanks, Zach. Um, Sarah, can you see? Yes. Yep. Am I viewing right now? Yep. Okay, uh, great. Okay, great. Hi everyone, uh, I'm Nicole Love, and my role within the Nature Conservancy is to bring the coastal resilience approach, and more specifically the tools that Zach was talking about, um, to the coastal decision makers and other stakeholders in the Gulf of Mexico specifically. So um, what we want to do in the Gulf um, through having uh, my, my position is to make sure that our stakeholders and partners, number one, know about the, the tool because um, we've, we've had this thought process that we're not going to say if you just build it, they'll come. Uh, we like to say if you build it and then take it to them <laughs> and show them how to use it, then they'll come. Um, so the first thing really is to be able to get people to, to know about the tool and then to be able to, to get them to, to know how they can use it to their benefit when um, they're working on their either their resiliency or their restoration planning efforts. And then number two, um, we want it to be able to assist them in, in 
making the decision support tool as relevant as possible to their work. And so um, this, this component of it is, is what to me makes this decision support tool a bit unique uh, from the, the rest of the decision support tools out there is just having that um, stakeholder engagement. And then another component of the tool that we like to um, focus on in the Gulf of Mexico is the ability of the tool to function at these different community scales like Zach talked about earlier. And so um, what I'm going to show you today is um, some of those, those apps that we have in the Gulf that we use at, um, at these different scales. And so I'm going to kind of back up just a little bit from what Zach was talking about. And the first app that I'm going to show for the Gulf of Mexico is this, this Map Layers app. And this is um, what we kind of deem as the spatial database. And um, as you can see, we have it at, we, we have these different folders and it functions, you know, much like the GIS uh, layers. And so we have data layers for the Gulf of Mexico and then each one of the states have their own folders and this is where the more state specific data is housed. Um, and so I'm just going to pull up a couple of quick examples of data and I'm going to pull up Gulf wide data and here I'm going to pull up another uh, I think unique function of this uh, decision support tool is that not only do we have these ecological data sets but we also have the social and economic data sets and um, I'm just going to pull up one which is the uh, this is the 2000 uh, census data and um, this is just the percent employed in ag and fishing forestry and again you could see this is uh, golf wide data so where we took the the big national uh, census data set and uh, cut it uh, specifically for a golf wide layer and then just to show you um, the idea of why it's important to kind of have these these different um, the states have their own specific data layers I'm gonna pull up the same uh, type of data. So I'm pulling up some bathymetry data in Mississippi and then the bathymetry layer in Alabama. And if I zoom in here, you could see that these data layers, while they're both showing bathymetry, they're both a little different in the way that they're represented. And again, that gets back to the, um, to the idea that these were um, very state-specific data sets. So within the Nature Conservancy, all of our Gulf states have what we call data managers. And um, these are the people that are responsible for understanding their state and the, um, the data sets that are really important and applicable to, uh, to, what, you know, to what resiliency planning or restoration planning efforts are happening within their state. And um, along that line, these uh, data managers are also tasked with every year going through and doing what we're calling a data sweep, which is where um, they will go through, look at all of the data for their state, and see if there are any new data sets. So if this bathymetry data was from you know, 1970 and there has been a, a 2010 uh, study that has updated bathymetry uh, information, they will go ahead and um, upload that. Again, making sure that, you know, within the Gulf we're always consistent and that we're always relevant to what our stakeholders and users are um, interested in. And so, so I just showed the um, Gulf-wide data sets, which are also, um, some of them are, are national data sets uh, that we have cut to uh, just show up in the Gulf. And then um, some data sets are national data sets that we are able to uh, now link directly to their web service. So I pulled up the Flood and Sea Level Rise app, and I'm not going to go into a lot of information about that app. But I wanted to show you that we have two um, data sets, or actually web services, that we are consuming through uh, the DS site. And that is the coastal flood hazards is FEMA. And um, I will just pull up a, uh, 
oops, sorry, not the one I wanted to do. Just pull up uh, just the data set so that you can see. And if I, I zoom out, again, this is going to linking directly to FEMA's website and pulling in the data. So one of the, the pros of that is that anytime FEMA updates their data layers, um, this will obviously automatically be updated as well, which is really super beneficial because we don't always have to be looking for those new data sets. And um, one of the cons of uh, being able to just, to just go out and consume web services rather than hosting the data ourselves is that, as you can see here, we're not able to cut this, this data set. So um, you are going to see it, you know, the data set running into uh, the, the east coast of the US. But at the same time, um, this is really beneficial because, as you can imagine, data sets are um, the amount of uh, storage capacity that is needed for those is, is tremendous. And so the capability to actually go and just uh, host, you know, grab those, those data sets and bring them into the tool or visualize them within the tool is um, something really uh, beneficial. So, so there's the national data sets and uh, the golf data sets, and then we have these statewide data sets. As you can see, we're focusing more and more and more um, closely on these localized um, uh, data sets. And to get even more localized, we have um, this community planning app. Uh, which is the location where communities can host their locally specific data to inform their decisions and track their successes. And so it's also where the community can come to view their information alongside all of the other coastal resilience data layers that we have. And so I'm going to talk a little bit about one area of Florida where, where um, that has been done pretty uh, successfully so far. So let me just show you um, your infographic. And then I'm going to focus on Charlotte Harbor. And so I'm going to just click on one data set where you could see that this is a um, very locally specific data set. This would be their critical infrastructure. Again, this comes from our Nature Conservancy um, Florida chapter working very extensively with Charlotte Harbor County. And, um, and the county folks being able to pull in this, this data set that they have. And if we were you know, pulling this, this data set for the entire Gulf, number one, it would be huge. And it doesn't also get into the personalizing for each one of these different communities. So, um, So as you can see, we, we are just start getting started in this community planning app because it's, uh, it's new. It, it came out with the, uh, the new version. And um, as, we, as we move forward with our stakeholder engagement component, we hope to be adding uh, more communities to that. And I'll come back to this in a minute, but um, talking about Charlotte Harbor, I also want to focus on um, another app that um, was created uh, specifically for the Gulf of Mexico, and this is the uh, Restoration Explorer. And um, this app allows uh, different user groups to examine the ecological and socioeconomic factors for restoration suitability. We currently, what you're going to see is um, for oysters. We also have one for mangroves that was developed out of the work that was done in Charlotte Harbor and in Punta Gorda. Um, that is not on this uh, actual, the, the audience site. Currently it's still um, on our development site somewhere. They're still working out a little bit of the kinks, but you'll get the idea of how the mangrove one could work as well. And um, so if I continue on that, I will go. Again, you can see we have the Restoration Explorer for each one of the states in the Gulf. And if I click on Florida, um, what you see now is, and if you, um, you're not seeing the legends on the map potentially because of your um, webinar user interface. Um, so if you just move that around, you'll, you'll be able to see the um, the legend on your lower right-hand side of your screen. 
And, um, and so what you have here are, for Florida, we have six different variables. We have ecological variables and then uh, three socioeconomic variables. And as you can see, there are these slider bars here. And what, um, what you get with the data that's encompassed in this app is what we're calling a suitability index. And so in your legend, you can see yellow areas are low suitability for oysters based on these six variables, all the way up to uh, high, which is the, the blue. And what this does is it allows a group of people, if you're working on an oyster restoration project and you're in a very specific community like Charlotte Harbor or Punta Gorda, which I'm going to zoom into you here, maybe I'm not zooming into the right area, sorry, hang on, I just lost Charlotte Harbor for a second. So if you zoom into the area um, in, in Charlotte Harbor, Punta Gorda area, you can see that this is still coarse, and so it's going to look a little grainy. But it still gives you the idea of where of areas that are more suitable for um, oyster restoration. And so if you put a bunch of people in the room that are really interested in doing this oyster restoration project, You've got um, ways of changing these variables based on what that user group are interested in. So you may have somebody who is really interested in having this oyster reef be there as a breakwater, as, um, as this natural infrastructure or living shoreline to protect the, um, the marsh or the shoreline behind it. And so in that case, you're going to click on, you're going to click high on the shoreline erosion score because you want to make sure that that reef is going to protect that shoreline. And at the same time, if somebody else is really interested in having that, um, that oyster reef produce viable oysters, we're going to want to make sure that all of the, the, param the ecological parameters that are necessary for growing oysters are also high. And so you can kind of see how, as I'm moving these slider bars, how um, the, the suitability index changes. Um, and again, this is where our Florida folks in um, at the Nature Conservancy Florida chapter were really interested in doing some restoration projects. So they sat down with their Charlotte Harbor County folks and they said, how can we work together on this? And they brought in other partners, including the National Estuary Programs. They, again, went to this community planning app, and they gathered all of the data that folks felt were necessary um, for, for being able to determine where to site this, these restoration projects. And I'm going to show you one layer, a couple of layers that they chose. Turn off the critical infrastructure. Um, so if I go to habitats, could look at this. Um, on the other thing that I was going to say about Charlotte Harbor is that not only were they looking at potential to do an oyster reef restoration project, but they were also looking at mangrove projects. And that's where the um, mangrove restoration explorer came in. Um, so if I pull up the the mangrove layer, you kind of see how that incorporates with this um, the suitability index. And then lastly, this oyster RSM results is um, taking a while to load. This is a data set that was completed by uh, the National Estuary Program. And it is uh, not really, oh, there it is. Um, so you can kind of see these areas in blue, and I'm going to really focus in on um, Punta Gorda area, um, because this is where they pulled up, so we've got all these different la data layers that are happening right now. I've got the future mangrove area, um, I've got these oyster RSM results that was uh, created by the National Estuary Program. 
And then I have this, this is, that was their suitability index. And then we have the suitability index that was created uh, for our decision support tool. And out of all of those, um, if we're looking here, I guess, I don't know, you can see my, um, my arrow, I think. Okay. And so right around here where we're showing this green and blue areas are coming up through the suitability index. And then also through um, some of the other, some of this other data set, this RSM uh, data set. They have chosen through this stakeholder engagement process of having everybody sit down at the table with all of these different data sets, looking at the decision support tool, um, visualizing everything, and then also using the people's on the ground knowledge of what's actually uh, happening in that area. They were able to identify this area where my cursor is, where they are going to do a subtitle uh, reef, oyster reef project. The Nature Conservancy is going to be working with a couple of other partners to do this, and they've, they've got the funding to do it. And they've got the buy-in from all of the citizens and from the, the other partners that are in that community. Um, one of the things that came up was as they were looking at this, you could see some of these channels here. And so that obviously became a very important issue that they wanted to make sure that the oyster reef was not in any place where uh, there was going to be a potential navigation hazard. Um, so this is where the benefits of having all of these different apps that we, ha that we have, and then just having the, the data layers um, on these different levels, the, the bigger national data sets, as well as these very localized specific data sets, and then having the on-the-ground people to go out and work with our communities um, really makes uh, the tool useful to um, on-the-ground uh, resilience, planning and restoration planning uh, within the Gulf of Mexico. And I think that's all I have. Okay, great. Thank you, Nicole. And, and Zach, did you have any follow-up? or? Oh, yeah, I'm sorry, I forgot. Nicole, why don't you just um, put this, yeah, that's that sixth slide up, it, and it really yep. kind of just targets a couple of diff a few different inactions besides Nic what Nicole presented in Puntagorda. Um, and I think Sarah because of the time, probably good to start entertaining some questions. Uh, we'll just leave this slide up so folks can read where we have uh, uh, putting uh, exactly what you said, Nicole, putting the, the tools in action uh, and they're meant, uh, meant to be used and we're taking them to uh, uh, these different places and, and others. Uh, and then in the final slide, maybe we'll spend the last two minutes on that uh, after we entertain some questions. How does that sound? Sounds good. Okay. Um, just real quick clarification question. I, I didn't uh, interrupt you, Nicole. The, the RSMs you were talking about, as in the Oyster RSMs, what does that, the RSM stand for? Yeah, uh, that was a, um, a data set that was created by that, uh, I think it was the Charlotte Harbor, er, yes, Charlotte Harbor National Estuary, National Estuary Program. And it's also, it was their, um, their version of a suitability index that I don't know all of the specific details of the, the actual data, but I guess that's one thing that we should have pointed out is that um, you can, uh, within the, the mapping tool, you can click on the, the little I button that's next to your, um, and I guess I could possibly pull that up quickly. Um, you can click on the I button and it will show you, it will give you the, um, a description of the data layer and it will also um, link you to the metadata. So if you want more information about what that data set was that I, uh, if for some, I don't have off the top of my head, um, you can click on that, that I button and pull up all of the information on it. Okay, great. Thank you, Nicole. Um, and Sorry. we have more questions than we'll be able to get to, so I'm going to have to pick and choose. Um, there was a question, can you export GIS files? 
there are some layers in the exact area actually where Nicole just showed in that blue icon. Uh, some of the data layers are downloadable in a zip file, and so if you were to go to them, um, uh, yeah, in there it would say download data. We don't have all the data downloadable. Uh, we're not uh, intending to redistribute source data, but our derived analyses uh, and data sets uh, will be uh, more and more downloadable. Okay. And what is your the capacity to enter regional data in grids? Um, the capacity is uh, uh, just within the infrastructure on our Amazon cloud. In other words, uh, that we've created a system here to be able to accommodate uh, a lot of different data, rasters, images, point line, polygon. Um, and currently we have, I think about, uh, I have a statistic on it, uh, 20 gigabytes of data in the system, and it's over 13 gigabytes of RAM to serve it out on the web. And so to the limits of that uh, and the infrastructure we have in place, being able to load and consume uh, raster data uh, should be no problem. OK, great. Um, let's see. Is this tool being used to model oil spill disasters? And if so, on what level? Um, Nicole, if you want to bring up the map layers, uh, since you're, you're sharing your screen, and go to Gulf of Mexico, coastal yeah. hazards, yeah. Uh, the, cu the total cumulative oil spill data uh, is something we worked with Irma on, the emergency response uh, management application of NOAA, uh, to create the, these data from their surveys post uh, spill. Uh, we're not currently modeling uh, anything other than that, though. Uh, but our partnership with the IRMA folks is good, and so we've been able to kind of exchange different data as the um, technical working groups were in their process uh, per ecosystem. So that partnership is uh, alive and well, and so the, one of the, the tricks of the trade is the ability to not only uh, consume web mapping services across tools, but be able to be really complementary with the tools themselves. And so the more links we have, the more sort of uh, ways we can connect different tools and say, Coastal Resilience does this. If you want to find out more information about something like oil spills, I would re uh, redirect you to the IRMA tool. Uh, we should be doing that as a community. OK, great. Thank you. And I'm going to summarize sort of the gist of several questions. Um, people have asked, are you going to be adding some specific areas? And uh, Alaska was mentioned, um, as well as some other locations. Um, and also, someone else asked, how do you use this tool if you fall outside the areas listed? So if you could sort of talk about what you can do with the global and US national tools, that would be helpful. Yeah, so um, I think what sets us uh, slightly apart from other tools is, is where we see sort of strategic opportunity to be identifying nature-based solutions um, and can certainly raise money to be implementing coastal resilience in those geographies uh, is really the key for us because um, taking action and working with communities, stakeholder engagement is really the paramount thing we're trying to achieve as opposed to sort of uh, other tools that are, are doing a really good job of just filling in the states or filling in a particular region and having that be a resource. Um, so the NOAA Sea Level Rise Viewer is a, is a great tool to be looking at different uh, uh, sea level rise interval information um, across the nation. And that is a comprehensive sea level rise viewing tool. And um, we're so glad that that's available. Coastal resilience is a little bit different where we're trying to couple that assessing risk with identifying solutions. And so our goal isn't per se to be in every coastal state uh, and in Alaska and Hawaii included, um, but to find those strategic opportunities uh, where we can take action on uh, some nature-based solution uh, work. And so I don't know if that directly answers the question, but our goal is not to be comprehensive as much as to be uh, taking conservation in action and restoration in action on the ground and using the tools to get us there. Yes, I think that, that addresses it well. Thank you, Zach. Um, let's see. Uh, 
can the tool be used to assess effects of other possible causes of sea level rise, especially, um, one, changes in marsh, marsh vegetation, species composition, productivity, and decomposition, and two, local land subsidence from oil and gas extraction, or are such causes built into local input data layers? Nicole, do you want to um, address that first part with the Feature Habitat app and the, um, the, the SLAM data that's available in the site? And then I can address the subsidence. Yeah, actually, um, so in the Feature Habitat app that I didn't uh, really talk a whole lot about, um, this is where we are housing um, the sea level rise affecting marshes model. Um, that was created by uh, Warren Pinnacle, and then um, and so some of these these sites are were actually done by Warren Pinnacle. Some of them were also done by um, were run. The models were run by our Nature Conservancy folks. So um, if I just pull up the the Charlotte Harbor uh, quickly, um, you can see what the um, there's a future mangrove area. And we have this, this coastal wetland change. If, if you know, I don't know how much you know about sea level rises affecting marshes model, but it does show you how your um, land cover changes. Um, and uh, sorry, let me just go zoom down to that one. You can see your land cover changes with uh, different uh, sea level rise scenarios. And um, to just quickly address the um, subsidence and oil and gas, um, some of that will be encompassed within the sea level rise affecting marshes model, of otherwise called SLAM. Um, and as I, I know currently that uh, there is, um, they're going to be trying to run a golf-wide SLAM model. Um, that will encompass, it's, it's one of the things that we've talked a lot about in the Nature Conservancy, the folks that are um, going to be running this model, is to make sure, especially in Louisiana, that's where I'm based. So in Louisiana, we, we really want to make sure that the um, subsidence uh, data, that a, a lot of that is through USGS currently. Um, so we're going to try to make sure that that's encompassed in the, uh, the golf-wide slam run. And then also, um, the, I can't remember the other one, the, uh, there's subsidence and another component that we're really making sure, and that's really kind of based on uh, Louisiana and the fact that um, Louisiana is so different in terms of the Gulf um, with all of the, the things that are impacting uh, the coastal marsh uh, disappearance. So, um, so go ahead, Zach, sorry. Yeah, no, that's great. Uh, I would just add that uh, subsidence is a key area of analysis for us. As we build in floodplain coastal integration as part of coastal resilience, uh, subsidence is sort of the number one analysis we need to be paying attention to, whether that's uh, uh, pulling out some of the accretion erosion rates out of SLAM, applying them to uh, specific areas and looking at perhaps LIDAR change detection on elevation, because you, you can clearly see uh, behind the dike uh, that, that the, line, the land is subsiding given different soil characteristics uh, and the fact that sediment isn't in the floodplain, it's going out into the bay uh, and in increasing the elevation of mudflats. So this is kind of an area that we need to address as we look at more coastal and floodplain work. Okay, great. Thank you, guys. Um, are there any plans to be able to compare site-specific green versus gray um, infrastructure development? Yeah, and that's another part of the holy grail here is to be able to economically and socially make the case for gray versus green. Uh, the coastal defense uh, app that I showed where it really clearly delineates the, that relationship can be extended to uh, summary statistics uh, um, on the, the relationship, certainly in, from an engineering standpoint, but also an economic standpoint. What's the cost of maintaining the dike system versus the conservation and restoration of the marsh infrastructure given its benefit in coastal protection? Uh, and so 
this is an area we continue to drive probably uh, the hardest in, uh, in sort of our identifying solutions uh, bucket of our approach. And so this is an area that, again, it's very scale dependent. And so I would say that uh, making that case needs to happen first at a very site scale uh, and then building out from there. OK. Great. Thank you, Zach. Um, would you guys want to do your last slide? And then if we had time, we'd, we'd get a few more questions. Sure. Yeah, so uh, just a couple of quick points, and, and then Nicole, pass it to you for any final uh, pieces here. But um, we continue to build out what we call the Coastal Resilience Network, and that gets back to the question of uh, where are you going next? Um, and so there's opportunities for us domestically in the, here in the U.S. and internationally to be give, building out coastal resilience. Uh, um, we, do, we didn't show a, our global application where we are using it really within policy venues, um, but that's a, an area of development that we hope to extend as we have uh, more international partners. Um, uh, and then I guess I'll just touch on the uh, uh, issue-specific apps that, that Nicole and I have shown. Uh, the, the ability to create these apps with partners has been very key for us. Even building apps that uh, are housed on, you know, on a different tool is, a, is an opportunity for us. Um, so the extension of, of our world of applications, uh, we've certainly taken that to heart here and hope to be working with uh, specific agencies, institutions, organizations through what we've done today in this webinar, different workshops, to find those strategic opportunities to be targeting a specific application, building it with partners in our efforts to uh, get coastal resilience in the hands of others, ultimately. So that's my kind of final parting message. Nicole, any, any parting message from you? No, that's all great. The, the flexibility of the tool is something that um, every time I talk about it, I, um, I, I always, I must say that word, usually I say it within about 50 times. So um, what Zach just said about building these issue-specific apps is um, something that with this, this new Coastal Resilience 2.0 that is really um, you know, beneficial, especially in the Gulf, to working with our partners. There are a lot of different tools out there. And, um, and obviously with the, the oil spill restoration money and um, everything else that's coming down in the Gulf to, to hopefully be able to work with our partners to have one central place where um, you know, we can have some, some visualization and, and data for the decision makers when they're looking at their um, restoration would be really, uh, is, is really critical to the Gulf of Mexico. And then within Louisiana, just as an example, we're um, our freshwater uh, team are working on a very the site is going to look exactly the same, except that it's going to be for uh, the freshwater portion of uh, Louisiana. And then um, you know, hopefully, the next steps with that are to connect the the, the freshwater and and floodplain to the coastal. And in Louisiana, that's obviously a huge thing because there are a lot of there's a lot of talk about diversions and and how the freshwater is going to impact the coastal environment. So, um, you know, just being able to keep building this out is really um, really crucial, and, and it's such a, a great site for that now. Okay, thank you, guys. Um, we just have a couple more minutes, so we'll, we could hit a couple more questions um, from folks who are still on. Let's see. Um, are all of the same apps available for each location? No. Um, so uh, really, I, th I think if you want to see the, the full suite of applications, the Gulf of Mexico is, is the site to see. Uh, they vary in, uh, in different geographies depending on uh, the decisions that are, are of focus for the organizations, partnerships, and, and stakeholders that are involved. So they do vary, uh, but there is some consistency in them. So if you see uh, um, Risk Explore in uh, the US application and then you uh, go to the New Jersey uh, web map, you will also see Risk Explore, and it's a sort of a cut of that. And so there is some consistency across the geographies, but then so there's a distinction, again, focused on specific issues. OK, perfect. Thank you. 
Uh, and one last question. Uh, is the tool open access? Yes, it is. Um, All right. So it is, uh, it is built on, uh, uh, there's a GitHub account, if you're familiar with that. It's all open source, uh, and you're free to uh, uh, take the code, modify it, credit uh, the creators of the code, um, and continue to extend its utility. So it is open source. Fabulous. Well, thank you, guys. Uh, this was a great presentation. It went very smoothly, considering all the live demo you guys did. And uh, <laughs> it's, it's, it's fabulous work, and we're so glad you're doing it. Um, so thank you very much for presenting today. And uh, if anybody is interested in the recording or a PDF of the PowerPoint aspect, uh, you can shoot me an email, and I'll send you the links. Uh, well, thank you again, guys. We really appreciate you doing this. Thank you, Sarah, so much, and thanks, Thank Nicole, for, for presenting. Okay. Thank you to all of you. Okay. Bye, everyone. Have a good day. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.